effect and that is you substituting other goods because of a relative price change so consumers uh, substituting goods because of a relative price change So, for example, a decrease in the price of um, pork so pork prices go down you're going to maybe buy less chicken if chicken's a substitute it is an aggregate anyway so you're going to buy less chicken and more pork. That's the substitution effect. So a decrease in price leads to an increase in the quantity of pork. And so what we're trying to say here is where are these increases coming from? Well, one place is that chicken is now relatively more expensive than So you buy less chicken and more pork. Buy less chicken and more pork. That's the substitution effect. Okay, any questions on that one? So another thing that happens is you feel richer or poorer from price changes. We call that the income effect. So if pork goes down in price, it's like you got a pay raise, right? So let's just say you normally spend, uh, oh, I don't know, just to make up an easy number, um, $60 on pork per month and pork prices fall in half, it's like you just got $30 in your hand, right? If you normally buy $60 of pork per month, then you feel richer and you have more money, and so that would also induce you to buy potentially some more pork, right? So from the income effect, though, it's because you feel richer. So the income effect is um, the price change causing you to have more disposable income. So if your pork spending, so if your total, I guess I'll write out 
total expenditure is what we did a little bit of yesterday. Kind of a fancy way of saying total spending. If your total expenditure on pork is $60 per month and pork prices are cut in half, you feel $30 richer. You feel $30 richer. <coughs> we didn't give you any income, so it's different than an income change, because we didn't talk about income changes as well, but this is kind of a net effect relative to our purchases. The income effect. Okay, questions or comments on that? Is this uh, no, I didn't, I, this wasn't in your notes before. Yeah, the law of demand, of course, was, but the, this is a, a separate thing that's in this chapter, the income effect and substitution effect. So yeah, I just, I mean, it, it's touching on topics that we did before, but. All right, um, so let's see, the other thing, I wanted to hit on was what influences the <coughs> elasticity of demand. So what makes the elasticity of demand um, vary? Right? So we saw that along a demand curve, we take that midpoint, what did that center us up on? What was the elasticity of demand here at the midpoint? One, so it was equal to one, so it was unitary elastic. And then as we creeped along the demand curve, these numbers all got bigger in absolute value, so they were greater than one. And they were approaching infinity by the time we get really, 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 really close to the horizontal axis. And then we had these numbers, this direction being less than one, but greater than zero. So less than one in absolute value, but greater than zero. So what makes it vary? And so this, this also applies to whether the demand curve is flat or steep. Um, so if I have a demand curve that is really flat, is that a relatively elastic demand curve or inelastic demand curve? Elastic. What's that? Elastic. E elastic. Okay, elastic. I heard it in there. All right, so yes, good. So it's flatter. What I wanted to point out, though, is that even if it's really flat, let me uh, just kind of put one on here. Let's say it flattened out like this. This demand curve still follows those same properties. And so what you'd have to do is extend this kind of up to about here, where it hits the horizontal axis. <coughs> and then find the midpoint. This looks pretty good. Da, da, da. What's the elasticity of demand right here? One. <coughs> So we say that this demand curve is elastic because if you calculate all the numbers in kind of the relevant <laughs> ranges of consumption, all the numbers are going to be bigger than one, right? So it's all going to be this upper section. Same thing if we take it again. I don't know if you want to muddy up your uh, notes or just try to absorb this one. So same thing with demand curve that got a little squiggly on me there. It's really inelastic. Why is that? Because if we bring this thing, I got in trouble once for writing on the wall. Oh, yeah, there. That's where it intersects the vertical axis, right? And so then if we take the midpoint, and we go dot, 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 
somewhere up there. And so if you calculate the elasticity of demand within this relevant range of prices, all of these numbers are how big? If we calculated the elasticity along any spot of this? Less than one. They're all inelastic, right? We're in this range. So we say that this demand curve is relatively inelastic. This one's relatively elastic. But all demand curves that are downward sloping of some degree follow the same property that we have, that they change at different points along it. Okay, so why is that? Number one is probably the most important one, and this is the availability of substitutes. The availability of substitutes. Which demand curve has more substitutes with it? The orange one or the green one? The orange does, right? So it's more elastic. If people, if you raise the price, people have lots of substitutes to go find, right? It's easy to fast food hamburger or something. They, they don't have much pricing power. They'll run across the street and get a, a fast food sandwich from another competitor. So if there's lots of substitutes, then we have a more elastic demand. So availability of substitutes, more substitutes means more elastic. one is the demand for a foreign auto? Yeah. Is it Toyota. Zach? Yeah. <clears throat> Orange is Toyota. Orange is Toyota, right? Why? Good call, because that one's that one kind of, some people are probably like thinking the other way, right? Because there's so many different options to buy. Yeah, and Toyotas are a foreign car, right? So in the, in the uh, availability of substitutes, if we define the good more narrowly, then we're gonna have more substitutes for it. So under this one, let's put note, the more narrowly a good is defined, <coughs> the more subs there will be. So from that example, Toyota versus foreign autos. Toyota is more narrowly defining what we're talking about with an automobile, right? It's a specific brand, so it's more narrowly defined. So this is more narrow in our definition of a car, and this is more broad, more broadly defined. <clears throat> and so the Toyota has lots of substitutes. We can substitute a BMW, we can substitute a Nissan, we can substitute a Hyundai, right? So they got lots of subs. So this one has lots of substitutes. This has fewer substitutes. Questions on that? Yeah. Sorry, I'm so confused. Wouldn't the foreign cars have more substitutes because there's like more brands and then those brands have more foreign or more different types of So uh, what I was trying to say here is uh, again I apologize maybe to my uh, international students in here as well, but since we're in the United States, the domestic autos versus foreign autos. Okay. So US autos versus foreign autos. Okay. Yeah. 
And so uh, we'd still have that as an available substitute of a GM or a Ford or something. Okay, good question. Anything else? All right, number two is the fraction of income. Fraction of income spent on the good. You're currently making $40,000 a year. If your income is $40,000 per year, do you care much if salt prices an outrage <laughs> right so if you're making forty thousand dollars a year you don't really care much about salt prices so salt might be two dollars but in the grand scheme of things it's two dollars a year versus four dollars a year even if salt prices double so uh, that's going to leave you a more uh, inelastic demand for salt so you don't really care So a small fraction, small fraction of income means a, a less elastic. So if we start talking, uh, you know, the latest, greatest flat screen TV that's running 2,000 bucks, 2,000 is a decent chunk of my $40,000 uh, income. And so we're probably gonna have a more elastic demand or response if its price doubles from $2,000 to $4,000, right? So we're gonna be more sensitive to that. And so now you can kind of see with these first with these first two here, how that tied into the substitution effect and income effect, right? That we started off with. So the elasticity, how many substitutes are out there? We're going to have a more elastic, and then also the fraction of income, um, how big of a dent it puts in your budget if the price changes. Okay, any questions on those two? The last one is the time spent. The time allowed, time allowed for a change in quantity demanded. So if you're going to have a, a Super Bowl party, and that is in two days, that doesn't give you as much time to shop around for a deal, as opposed to if you would have been thinking a month ago, right? And then now you can shop on Amazon, buy it somewhere else in the United States, have it shipped to your house, right? So your demand for uh, today, and maybe I'll just do this on one, so your demand today 
versus if we allow, so this would be one day, one week, one month. So more time allows you to seek substitutes. So more time leads to a more elastic demand. So you get more time to shop for substitutes. That's kind of the key point here. More time to look for substitutes. to the elasticity of demand. Now, the next section is the elasticity of supply. So the elasticity of supply. And it's almost a joke, actually, what your book does. I just want to show you guys. So I said this next upcoming section, and you're like, geez, we've been talking about this all week, and now we got to learn the elasticity of supply. This is all there is. <laughs> That's all the author wrote in the whole textbook on the elasticity of supply. And the reason is, is if you really learn the elasticity of demand, you've kind of already learned the elasticity of supply. So it's just kind of applying those same concepts, but now, we're thinking about the response by producers on how much they're going to put on the shelves. So I might kind of first put on basically same concept as the elasticity of demand. <laughs> and you guys already have the you know the chapter three content where we talked about the supply curve being flatter or steeper, so we're we're kind of come a long ways on this. So the formula for the elasticity of supply is simply inserting the percentage change in the quantity supply divided by the percentage change in the price. How sensitive are suppliers? So the definition then we'll put here as a number that shows, and let, let's sneak in unitless number. We talked about that last time, so let's just say a unitless number, just to kind of remind ourselves it's not a, it's not a dollar, it's not a number of beers or a percentage. It's a unitless number that shows the responsiveness of quantity supplied by producers to a given change in price. And so the formula still works out the same of the new number minus the old number divided by the average of the two, all divided by the new price minus the old price divided by the average price. So we got kind of a percentage change formula that's modified slightly by this average business. And in your book, they might be using like P1 and P0, right? So for instead of new and old, 
Remember, just kind of make sure you're matching it up. So whatever uh, on a supply curve, on a supply curve, it would be matching a couple of different numbers here on, if this is P1 and this is P0, then we're doing a price decrease. So the numbers are corresponding to price going down. And when price falls, the quantity supply, P0 and Q0 go together, and P1 and Q1 go together. What is the sign of the elasticity of supply? Positive or negative? The elasticity of supply. Is that good? So we talked about the demand curve always being negative, even though we do the absolute value. What is it going to be? Positive. And why is it positive? Because it goes up, basically. A positive relationship between the price of the product and the quantity that's being supplied. Right? Price goes up, quantity supply goes up, so now your numbers are going to come out with a positive number of value. <coughs> okay, so. That's going to be a nice segue into the next chapter. You also have a section that we've already talked about some of the concepts on. It's, it's a, a bonus section on the special topic. So you'll have a, a little bit of that with your homework for this week. And it talks about the uh, all different effects of government regulation and uh, uh, how to approach uh, problems where we have like the ocean fish and pollution. So that is that is that addition for this time. So technically we got chapter 20 and special topic number 12. And if, uh, if you had a physical book, which you guys pretty much scroll through, the special topics are at the back. And we'll be doing a couple more of those um, as well. Okay, so now we get to crack into Chapter 21. So, and this kind of leads us up nicely here. So, Chapter 21 is going to focus in on the cost of doing business. So, we're going to flip now from the consumer to the producer. And think about what goes on in their decision-making process. <clears throat> okay, so um, there's different types of ownerships of businesses that are out there. So the chapter kind of starts off looking at types of ownerships. So types of ownership structure. In business. How many of you got a mom or dad or both that run their own business? Usually a handful of people, so about 20% or so. So um, they can structure the ownership in different ways. Those of you who raised your hands, do you know how your parents have it structured? Like what's the legal structure of their business? Does anybody know? Looks like no. Okay, that's why we like to talk about it, because it, there's some uh, important aspects of structuring your business um, to um, sometimes protect yourself. So a sole proprietorship is usually kind of a small business deal. So most people starting their own business, you might have a proprietorship. So it's usually a individual owner, so it's sometimes called a uh, sole proprietorship, an individual owner who takes on all liability from business operations. So you take out, you know, you have insurance policies and that sort of thing. 
And this would include debts as well. So you're personally obligated to the debts. But large fraction of mom and pop, hey, I want to start my own business. Hey, I want to sell stuff on Etsy. I'm um, doing stuff on eBay or whatever. Just, you know, you start running a business. Um, from the government standpoint, when you go to file your tax returns, assuming you're doing this above board, then you would be listed as a sole proprietor and you will just claim that income and those expenses right on your kind of normal filing. <coughs> All right, so then people also bring on partners. So a partnership is a nice way to kind of spread the liability among the owners. So uh, multiple people getting together to run the business, right? So multiple owners with uh, liability. And then you can kind of get into variations on this. So there can be limited partnerships where somebody's the money person, right? Um, so if you're the, the money gal, uh, you've got uh, a million dollars and you're like, hey, McCullough, I like what you're doing with rental properties and stuff. I'd like to get in on that action. Um, I'd like to invest 100,000 in this, but I don't want any liability beyond the 100,000 I'm putting into it. And so you can kind of structure your partnership so that McCullough's taking on all of the other liabilities and the money gal is just responsible for the 100,000 and that's it. And so that's the risk that that person's taking on. So there's variations of these things and it usually comes down to this liability issue. All right, how many of you have heard of a limited liability company, LLC? Once you say LLC, most hands start to go up. Okay, so the LLC was an uh, innovation and in, uh, structure to kind of help protect people from having unlimited liability. So the problem with these setups is that if, um, so one time when I was, uh, this was my real estate mentor boss, uh, we had a, um, oh, at the time, probably $1.2 million 12-plex. So it was a 12-unit apartment building that we had built. And uh, this woman in January in Iowa took her infant baby out to the mailbox to get the mail, slipped and fell, and the baby suffered an, a head injury. And so... We, long story short, ended up getting served a lawsuit for $12 million. And so the building all by itself was only $1.2 million, right? And so depending on the liability structure of how that worked, that could wipe you out, right? If you lost a lawsuit, if you had a $4 million net worth or something, you potentially are putting all of that at stake if something happens. So there's other ways to structure it so that you're limited to just the assets of the entity that owns it. So most of my real estate holdings that I have and still have are with a limited liability company. So limited liability company. LLC. Um, the key feature here is that owners of the LLC, which can be multiple owners too, so it's kind of a blend. It, it, you can have an LLC that you own by yourself as well, but the owners of the LLC uh, have liability limited to the assets 
assets of the LLC. And so the example I gave you here is, let's say it's a $12 million lawsuit from a slip and fall injury. If the 12 flex, too many 12s in here, is worth 1.2 million with debt of 1 million, the most the owners stand to lose is their equity in the 12 flex, 200,000. So the owners may lose the $200,000 of equity. Basically, their equity just means their ownership in the place, right? So we've got a $1.2 million place, a million dollars worth of debt, so you're kind of 200,000 to the good. And so if the lawsuit is successful and they win, then the 12 plex would be sold, the debts would be paid off, and the, the people who sued would be entitled to whatever they could get above that. So in this case, 200,000 the way I laid it out. Okay, any questions or comments there? How did the lawsuit end? Oh gosh, it was a, uh, it ended up being kind of a sham deal uh, and it took a long time because they wanted to check. And so at the end of the, so this is probably getting into too many details, but um, we have like an umbrella policy that goes over the lawsuit. And so uh, the people had up to, um, the insurance with coverage uh, from my boss at the time was an umbrella policy that brought it up to like two million. And so uh, once the lawsuit was going, and you know, sometimes they can try to you know, go beyond the, the suit depending on the circumstances, but once that was cleared, then the people suing went from 12, okay, we'll do six million. Okay, we'll do three million. And then it came down to two million and then my boss was like a little relieved because like, okay, now it's the insurance problem. Like for sure it's out. And I think they ended up settling for $500,000. But that's the way lawsuits go. Like they start at 12 and you know, they kind of shoot for the moon and then they settled out of court for like, I think I believe it was 500,000 within the insurance company covered it all. Yeah. So So our, yeah, once it got uh, to our insurance policy, then no, our, our building was safe and our equity was safe. That's what you buy an insurance policy for. So once it got to the, under the amount of the insurance, then we were, we were fine. Yeah. And so yeah, we, it's purely the insurance, you know, you make your monthly payments with premiums and that's what it pays for. Yeah, see another hand, you good? Okay, so then our, our uh, <coughs> last one we'll talk about is the corporation. Uh, limited liability companies are limited to, I think it's 50 owners. I haven't looked at that for a while. So if you're a really big company, you can't have this legal form of ownership. Um, so it, it, if you get into uh, you know, bigger companies, then you're going to file as a corporation. All right, so, um, so the business, business is owned by shareholders. Or stockholders, same thing. <laughs> And the advantage to this type of ownership is that you can have literally millions of owners if you want, or thousands of owners. So business is owned by the shareholders, and those owners, so the shareholders, are limited 
is liability to the value of the stock. So for example, if you buy $1,000 of Tesla stock, and this is something you guys know, but you might not have really ever thought about it. The most you can lose is a thousand bucks, right? Tesla stock goes under and it's worthless. Um, in most cases though, you're not gonna lose it all. If uh, Elon Musk uh, does some things and causes the stock to tumble, well, even cutting it in half, you just would sell when it's worth 500, right? So you're, but you're, you're basically, your ultimate loss is limited to the value of the company. So when I was a junior in high school, um, I did my research and uh, uh, into what's called penny stocks. So I was um, probably the equivalent of some of the YouTube crap and TikTok crap that you guys see today with get rich quick type of stuff. Um, and so kind of got on penny stocks. And so the idea of a penny stock was that you can buy a lot of stock in a company and it's fairly cheap. So I put in $500 as a junior in high school, uh, which was a lot of money back then, 500 bucks, right? This is 30 plus years ago, by the way, 32, 34 years ago now at least. And so I put 500 in and uh, I watched it for a year, just start to go down and down and down. And I decided, oh, I'm gonna hold out what they did is they had a new technology that cured fillings faster. You know the thing that the dentist zaps on your filling to kind of set the filling? Well, they had a new latest greatest technology of some sort. And like I said, I did all my research and I lost all my money. So that was my first introduction into stocks and I just hung on to it. It was almost kind of a joke. I think at some point when they went belly up, you know, I, my stock was worth 32 cents or something. So I went from 500 up to 32 cents. But again, any other liabilities that that company took on, I wasn't responsible for, right? So uh, that's the advantage of the, of the corporate structure. So you can have uh, lots of people own it and um, anything on the structures. All right, so why are these uh, different? So kind of the key aspect for this point of the structures um, with business is that um, you need to calculate profit and file a tax return. So corporations have the toughest return to file. So corporations have the most regulations on the filing of tax returns, and reports to shareholders. And so this ends up being, you know, for most people, relatively expensive. So if you're a corporation, just to give you an idea, like, so uh, how much you guys pay, did you pay to get your tax return, uh, somebody to uh, file it for you? Most of them's kind of free, especially at your guys' age, but uh, even if you could went in and sat down with them, you could probably get it done for 80 bucks. And if you ran, a, if you filed as a corporation, um, you might be looking at 2000 to $5,000 and this is a small corporation, uh, just from the additional things that need to be done with the filing. And so one of the reasons the government created these alternative ownership structures is to 
encourage business, right? To encourage entrepreneurship. And so you can set up a limited liability company. I did it here in Kansas when I moved here. I was able to set it up and I kind of knew what I was doing, but about 40 minutes and I was a legal entity to start um, uh, doing uh, things with the uh, business I have for my rental properties. So they try to make it easy for people to be, you know, starting their own business and have these levels of protection where the similar to the levels of protection that are here, but this is big business kind of versus small business. All right, have a good weekend. Go Chiefs. We'll pick